about you. Um, if you have an opinion they don't like, if you uh, express a political position that doesn't cohere with theirs, they will accuse you of all sorts of ugly, horrible things. And hate speech is one of the ways they try to shut down speech on campus. But your university, to its great credit, the University of New Mexico, has reaffirmed its commitment to free speech. Not only, not only has it declined to close this event down, but it also very sensibly waived um, a last minute, a large last minute security fee. This is one of the ways that campuses try to impose censorship by the back door um, on conservative speakers. That wasn't a joke, but thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's one of the ways that they sort of, in, it's a slippery new way they have of trying to get rid of the speakers they don't like. You will never find uh, a progressive, a liberal, a feminist, a Black Lives Matter, any of these speakers victim to last minute thousands of dollars in security fees. It just doesn't happen. But when conservatives decide, or libertarians even, or gays with the wrong opinions even, Anybody who doesn't like the crazy, batshit feminist left is invited onto campus. The students who do it will find themselves victim of these last-minute security fees. Five days before the event, they'll say, hmm, yes, good, good luck with your event. By the way, $3,500 by Wednesday, or you can't graduate and the event won't happen. Anyway, this university very wisely, I think your acting president, your acting chancellor, very wisely rescinded that um, pending review of the entire policy. So, it's a, you know, it's worth... I spend a lot of time um, being mean about professors, throwing their picture up with, the, you know, with captions like, fat faggot. Um, <laughs> he was. Um, but... Credit where it's due. You must always applaud people when they do when they do things that are right. Now, many universities have blocked my shows from speaking, uh, blocked me from speaking. But the three and a half thousand dollars, we're very happy, has been removed. Now, UNM knew the college Republicans had a slim chance of paying that fee since the college has already taken all their money through tuition fees. Um, but something amazing happened. It was the acting president, um, and it was uh, Chowki T. Abdullah, who um, what he. What he lacks in looks, he makes up for in his attitude to free speech and to security fees. So we should be grateful for that. And he said, the University of New Mexico is committed to the principles of free speech and values our role as a marketplace of ideas in the community, which is splendid. And it was followed up by a little bit of extra salt in the wound for social justice warriors. Just a little bit of extra pain for the feminist and Black Lives Matter campaigners. Marsha Baum, the chair of the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee, sent around her own communication to your professors. And it said, although we may disagree with the speakers, position or words, the university faculty should support each student's freedom of in inquiry and expression, both inside and outside of the classroom. Now, it might just be me, but I think that's the sound of social justice hegemony, of the iron grip of the worst, most bigoted, most um, fact-free, shrieking harpies on campus, determined to punish anybody who doesn't conform to their own bizarre, fact-free, conspiratorial view of the universe. That sounds to me like their iron fist falling away. So congratulations, and you're welcome. We are making progress. <coughs> We're making progress. 2017, as I predicted it at the beginning of 2016, 2017 is the year social justice fucking dies. And now that we've established I can say whatever the hell I want, let's talk about borders. All right. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about your borders, America's borders, and why America both deserves strong borders and why you are not evil, heartless, terrible people for wanting them. There's no better place on my tour to talk about borders because we're in a border state. The Southwest down here has essentially become trans-Mexican. Thanks to decades of bad policy on illegal immigration, we can only pray that Daddy will reverse some of the damage. But before we talk about some of the policies that may... Well, I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to do it. I mean, have we, has there ever been a president who has enacted as much of what he promised to do in his first week in office? This has never happened before. I mean, the guy's just been on this incredible, like, executive order spree. They're just sort of like vomit. It's just sort of keeps 
tumbling out of him. One day it's security, one day it's, it's wonderful. It's a politician who actually does what he says. It's incredible. But before we talk about some of those policies, we have to knock down a few cherished liberal canals. The progressive left, and sadly establishment Republicans too, the mantra of globalism, globalization, has dictated unlimited immigration of everybody across completely open borders. You'll remember that Hillary Clinton was caught saying that she believed in completely open borders. And this is utterly retarded. Completely stupid, not least because just because you share a border with a country geographically, you happen to be near them or next to them. Why does it follow that the citizens of one country must be compelled to pay for the citizens of another? To pay for their health care, to pay for schooling, to mop up the consequences of their crime. It's completely ludicrous. But it is a sort of, it's become a sort of maxim in polite society, even with, uh, for those of conservative politics, that if you don't agree that you should simply take care of anyone who happens to find themselves in your country, that you must somehow be racist. But this isn't an, are you right up there? But this isn't an issue of skin colours, it's an issue of borders and of ideas and of what it means to be a country and of how... Are you alright, sweetheart? Do you need some Xanax? <laughs> you seem to be very overexcited. There's a Q&A at the end. If you could save your boneheaded, obnoxious remarks for that, I'd be grateful. Thank you, darling. I'm perfectly happy for you to make an idiot of yourself later, but don't interrupt me or you'll, or you'll be asked to leave. All right, the first thing liberals say when you talk about controlling immigration is that you're racist. I mean, let's be honest, it's the first thing they say about anything. Anything you disagree on, they will call you a racist. But illegal immigrants aren't a race. They're people who don't belong in your country. And we know that the... There's this sort of weird idea through this whole election that, um, you know, talking about the fact that crime comes from a particular place has sort of racial overtones. Well, it doesn't. And here's a sort of dirty secret that I would like to reveal to you, Americans. Hispanics are white. I'm sorry to break it to you. Progressives in your country have done this weird job of breaking everyone down into categories, whether it's by sexuality, skin color, like whatever it is. They want to sort of break you all apart and set you against each other. Well, I'm from Europe, and let me tell you, Spaniards and Portuguese people, you know, our neighbors in Europe would not be considered anything but white. It's an invention of the American psyche that these people, because they have a different culture and slightly different skin color, must be considered a special category. They're not. They're like you. They just belong somewhere else. And the idea that there's some sort of racial overtones to this comes out of this progressive insistence that any patriotism, any belief in the Constitution, America, American values, capitalism, property rights, freedom, freedom of speech, must necessarily be somehow to do with race. But they did that. You didn't do that. Republicans didn't do that. Libertarians didn't do that. The left did that. And the left did that as part of their insane and endless quest to divide people up. It always mystified me as a European why Americans buy this stuff about, oh no, I'm not white, I'm Latino. It's just weird, so get the fuck over it. Really, America. I mean... We don't have the problems with... We don't have the same sort of racial conflict in Europe that you have here. We had slavery. By some measures, we invented it. We also brought it to an end sooner. But we don't have the kind of racial conflict in Britain that you have here. And part of the reason for that is that we haven't had a very strong progressive left element in the media and in politics constantly reminding people of how they're different and constantly race-baiting. There are no Al Sharptons or Sean Kings or DeRay Mackesons in the United Kingdom. Because people understand in Britain that what you think and who you are is more important than your skin color. And it's very peculiar, it's very peculiar to me. It's very peculiar to me that and you're entitled to in the Q&A. Pipe down. We don't have the kind of racism that does happen here. Of course, you know, most of the time the racism in America is moving in the opposite direction from the one you're told it does. For instance, that video in Chicago of four people torturing 
a mentally ill white kid shouting, fuck white people and fuck Trump, which the police wouldn't even categorize as a hate crime, not because they're incapable of seeing that it is one, but because they're scared of what will happen if they do. You're right up there. Somebody really should get you some pills. You should have some of the meth. <laughs> but I wish that people would stop talking about racism unless they're actually talking about other races. In the same way that you should not extend civil rights frontier to cross-dressers and reserve it where it belongs for black people and the emancipation of black people, you should similarly keep discussions of racism for prejudice between races. Now, I'll tell you something else that isn't a race that America is going to have to deal with in the next decade, and that is Islam. Now, Muslims can be from the Middle East, from Africa, and they can even be soulless gingers from the United Kingdom. Um, now, there's a... I wrote a piece about this, and nobody believed me at the time. Nobody thought I was telling the truth, and it was called um, Attack of the Ginger Jihadis. Um, no, 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 it's very true. There is, statistically, if you, it, so we did, a, we did a survey of the literature, because the, so the, the think tanks know about this, but they won't tell you, and the police sort of will sort of nod at you if you're a journalist and sort of say, well, yeah, we have noticed that, but we can't tell you anything about it. Um, basically, the, the gin, people with red hair are vastly more likely um, to, to convert to radical Islam. So white, the, 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 the technical uh, explanation, the, sorry, the, te the, te the technical, the precise trend is white British converts to radical Islam are vastly disproportionately likely to be red-headed by, by an order of magnitude, like many, many multiples. And there are some, uh, nobody really knows why it is. It could be that uh, they get discriminated against so they look for a club to be a part of, or it could be that gingers are just genetically predisposed toward terrorism. Nobody knows. Um, but... <laughs> But it, but it is true, but they, ca they can look like this. You know, there's a there's sort of hook-handed cleric um, in, in England um, who has a sort of harem of ginger groupies uh, you sometimes see on the news. Um, anyway, like any set of ideas, Islam, uh, Islam is it's like a religion. It's any set of ideas. It deserves to be scrutinized. Well, I have scrutinized it, and I have found it wanting. I have found it lacking. Everywhere there is Islam, you will find women oppressed. Everywhere there is Islam, you will find... You're wearing a hijab in the United States of America. What is wrong with you? You see, they want to shout you down by saying, oh, what about me? I'm not so oppressed. Well, let's take, let's move on from women. If you don't care about female genital mutilation, don't care about forced marriages, don't care about acid thrown in the faces of your Islamic sisters, if you don't care about any of those things, fine. Let's talk about gays instead. In 12 Islamic countries, I could be killed for my sexuality. Is that okay? People, 100 million people live in countries where it is illegal to be homosexual. All of those countries are Islamic. This is not an ISIS thing. You know, you will see gays being thrown off the roof in ISIS-controlled territories. But this has nothing to do with terrorism. This is mainstream Muslim culture. Your religion does it everywhere your religion exists. It is a threat, an existential threat to gay people. Everywhere in the world there is Islam. You will find women oppressed, homosexuals murdered, you will find gang rape. Now, there's a unique phenomenon that it doesn't really exist outside of Islamic cultures, of familial gang rape, where fathers, brothers, and cousins go out raping people together. It happened in Rotherham in the UK. And the liberal establishment in the UK didn't investigate this because according to a government report, not a far right-wing blog, um, according to a government report, 1,400 young girls were raped in racially or religiously, as you choose to define it, motivated crimes because both the police and the authorities were too scared of being called racist to intervene. And this pattern repeats itself everywhere there is mass Muslim immigration. My suggestion to you, America, is that you don't need it here. Learn your lesson from 9-11. Learn your lesson from Orlando. These socially regressive, oh, obviously they walk out when they don't like the facts. These socially regressive attitudes. <laughs> these socially regressive attitudes of Muslims in the West are horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. The surveys show that 52% of British Muslims think that my sex life should be made illegal. 
39% of them. Why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? Don't you want to talk about numbers? Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed of the hateful culture that surrounds your religion that oppresses women and murders homosexuals and commits unspeakable acts of terrorism? Are you ashamed of it? Would you like to talk to us about why there's no global Muslim peace movement? Because I don't hear, I hear lots of very upset people at my talks complaining about statistics they can't refute. I don't hear a lot of Muslims standing up against terrorism. The problem, the problem is that, um, the problem is, to give an example, Hillary Clinton took $140 million from Saudi Arabia. You can't really expect anyone in the Democrat Party uh, to speak up about this stuff. And after Orlando, they didn't. And this guy was homegrown, and this is another very worrying thing. The Pakistani Muslims in, um, in the UK are becoming less integrated, not better integrated, as successive generations grow up. The UK now sends more fighters to ISIS than any other country, with the exception of Belgium, which has a huge Islamic radical problem. So there's something different. You know, you hear occasionally when people say, oh, well, you know, the UK, you know, United States is a nation of immigrants. And, and the UK is a nation of immigrants. Well, yes, that's true to a point, but the immigration we have now looks a little different to the immigration from the past. And the Irish and the Italians who came in, many of whom, are, you know, particularly in New York, they came here because they want to participate in the American dream. But Islamic immigration to Germany and to the UK, and I'm sorry to say it's beginning here too, and I come as a warning from Europe desperately trying to persuade you not to allow this to happen since you haven't learned your lesson from 9-11, you haven't learned your lesson from Orlando, is don't allow these people to come here who do not wish to participate in the American dream and to, turn their, and to make their, their lives better for themselves and for their families, but want to turn America into the shithole they came from. Amen. Don't do it. One hundred percent of Muslims in a survey done by Channel 4, a left-leaning broadcaster, said that they found homosexuality an unacceptable lifestyle choice. One hundred percent. That's more than Palestine, where it's 97%, which liberals also love to, <laughs> love to stick up for. Never mind the fact that if you're gay, the only place you would dare to be in the Middle East is, of course, Tel Aviv. Now, if you want to see a real display of racism, um, you, know, you might want to find one of your Hispanic friends who support Trump, who dares to speak out that they support Trump, and you'll see a real freak out. You'll see a, you'll see a sheer... There we go. You will see from liberals Shia LaBeouf levels of spurging out when you discover a homosexual or Hispanic or a woman or, or heaven forfend somebody black who likes Donald Trump. They'll be called all sorts of names and believe me, I've been called all of them. So, what's that doing? Oh, you're good. So the other argument we run into as you know, this, this America is a nation of immigrants, you know. You, you, have it on, you have it on your statue, you know, you have it on there. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. And there is some truth, there's a lot of truth, to both the UK and the US being refugees. But many of the people coming over here are not refugees. They're migrants, they're economic migrants. And many of those are people who come here with very unpleasant intentions. And your law enforcement are tied and hamstrung. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a border officer in Obama's America. I mean, you can imagine what these guys go through, trying to, try, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> imagine what these guys go through. But as I say, immigration looks a little different today than it did whether in the ancient past or as recently as 1940 or 50. Now, your families keep various traditions from the old country if you have some Irish ancestry, which I think every American I've ever met claims to be Irish. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you actually are. Um, but immigrants of the past, as I say, they want to be American. I don't understand, you know, why anybody would want to turn this country into Syria or Somalia. Why come here if you just want to bring your origin country with you? Why would anyone want that? And I'll give you an example. The uh, Sanev brothers who committed the Boston bombing. They were, of course, Muslim asylum seekers. And Zokar was a naturalized citizen while Tamil was still waiting 
to be naturalized. Don't be misled by the names. These were Muslim asylum seekers. And these thugs were not people who wanted to be American. Tamerlan used to tell people um, to turn off music because he says it was not permitted by Islam. And additionally, they were long borders, which explains even more than the religion. But one thing is clear. This sort of, well, what we saw over there, sadly, brainwashed women. This is not something that should ever appear on a citizen of the United States. This should never be seen in America. It's a symbol that the wearer has decided to stand back from American values, from the, from the things that made this country extraordinary. <laughs> All the same people until they come at you in a bomb vest. All the same people until you're minding your own business in a gay club in Florida and one of them opens fire. Sure. Now, you're made to feel bad about a lot of this stuff by a spate of hate crime hoaxes. And there are dozens of examples of this. In fact, I, I did an article that sh that, um, a little while ago on Breitbart. We found 100 in the last uh, 10 years of the, the, the hate crimes the media had really played up you know, in an attempt to make you feel bad. You know, sort of the, and the implication is that you know, somebody like you did this, you know, and that's why we call you the names we do. And that's why you have to let us do all of the stuff that we want, because otherwise you're racist and you're saying this is good. So whether it's you know, the lesbians who painted queers on their own garage, or the lesbians who carve things into their own arms and claim they were raped at music festivals who weren't. Or the lesbians, it is always lesbians, by the way. Um, <laughs> very often, very often lesbians. Or whether it is some of the Islamic hate crime hoaxes we've been seeing more recently. And these happen with alarming frequency. In fact, I, I've struggled to find, my research team has struggled to find a supposed hate crime against Muslims on an American college campus that did not turn out to be fake. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about some of them. One student at the University of Louisiana admitted her attack was completely fabricated. She made the whole thing up because Trump supporters attacking a Muslim woman is simply believable to liberals fed a steady diet of hate by the fake news. This is a rare instance of the lying media actually admitting that one of its cherished hate crimes was a hoax. Normally they just move on quickly and never mention it again. Yasmin Sawi, just 18 years, ago, 18 years old in New York City, made up a similar story. She said three men called her a terrorist and attacked her, telling her to get out of the country. Again, it was fake. But you won't read the corrections, you only read the outrage. Um, and here's a, a brand new one that can't be blamed on Trump supporters because it took place in Austria. A 14-year-old girl claimed she would, was attacked and that evil white men tried to rip off her hijab on a train. The police revealed it to be a complete fabrication as well. And a little closer to home. Oh, we're still having trouble at the back. Three down. <laughs> Three down. I think, if you, I think if you take the second left, the airport is just... Um... Actually, no, we don't want them there, do we? <laughs> it's a bit of a problem, actually. I, I hadn't really thought this through. <laughs> Cross the Atlantic. <laughs> A little closer to home at the University of New Mexico, a female Muslim student, freshman Lena Agard, told a similar story of suffering an attack at the hands of what she called a buff Trump supporter. This is what we know, uh, what we know in journalism as a tautology, because of course all Trump supporters are by definition stronger, hotter, funnier, smarter, and more popular than everyone around them. Now, the interesting thing about this case is that the story was dropped by the media almost immediately as soon as it was reported. Now normally they try and follow up, they try to find out the perpetrator, they do these sort of colour pieces, she might have got a segment on CNN, but something happened, they just sort of dropped it. And we got in touch with a few of these journalists and we couldn't work out why they dropped it and they wouldn't tell us. I mean it must have been a real incident, she said so. I'm not accusing you of lying exactly, Lena, but how, why is it that you found time to report this to the, the press, this harrowing crime you, you supposedly endured? You found time to report it to the press but not to the police. Because when we checked, and when other, well, other journalists checked, it turned out that the only people who knew about this crime were left-wing journalists. The police had never heard of it, and they still haven't investigated it because she still hasn't reported it. Why would all these fake attacks be devised in such a way as to illustrate our differences? Well, I'll tell you the answer. These social activists 
with the horribly regressive attitudes that they stick up for about women and gays and intolerance for non-Muslims have no interest in assimilation. Let's talk about another group. Latinos face uh, a challenge in assimilation. For one thing, <laughs> isn't he lovely? I love him. Um, for one thing, their identity is confused. Now, I've, my Hispanic friends are, you know, are very fr frustrated with me on this subject because they insist you know, they've got this proud Latino identity. And the problem is that nobody can really tell me what this means. And I'm trying to ask, well, what does it mean? And ultimately, it just boils down to where they think their parents came from. And I've worked out that it's because the left has told them, you're, you're not white, you're a special group, so you get stuff. And if anyone's ever mean to you, it's because they're hateful, straight, white, male, misogynist, bigot, transphobe, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you see, if it, what, I mean, call them out, sure. Um, you know, tr Trump supporter, and it's more of a crime when people do bad things to you than it is when you do it to a white person because, well, we don't know really, but it's quite a good idea to just sort of divide people up like this because then they will end up voting for us. And the way that you know this is a sort of inve invention of the left, and I, feel, I sort of feel sorry for my Hispanic friends um, in this. The way you know it's an invention of the left is you ask people more probing questions about their identity and you discover that this sort of Latino identity in the United States is almost entirely a sort of fabrication invented by the left, by academics and by journalists. This doesn't really mean anything. A 2011 Pew Research Center survey of Latinos in America showed that just 20% of them thought of, thought of themselves as American. Only 24% of them, though, thought of themselves as Latino. So immediately you've got fewer than half of these, but they're really confused. And the remainder thought of themselves either a mixture or whatever they thought they might have come from if, uh, ultimately, and they didn't all know whether that was, which is Mexico or Brazil. According to this survey, saying Latino is a bit like saying LGBT or whatever letters they've added this week. <laughs> Gays and lesbians don't like being lumped together because we don't think alike at all, but people still do it, to say nothing of the offensive association with mentally ill cross-dressers. But Latinos, Latinos, according to that survey, seven out of ten Latinos don't believe there is a, a common Latino culture, because the whole thing is a liberal confection. And the other challenge we have with Latinos is language. Um, the book We Wanted Workers by George Borjas makes the, makes the argument that recent immigrants are learning English more slowly than previous immigrants, thanks to the rise of ethnic enclaves, sort of ethnic ghettos. This is, this is the Islam problem again. The multiculturalism project, the idea that we should divide everybody up, split them all up, let them just do their own thing in their own areas. Well, it's leading people to forget why they, they live in this country in the first place, and many of them to why they came here. It's not breeding good Americans, it's not breeding good citizens. And before you start thinking this is from a right-wing think tank or an evil right-wing blog, Borjas is a professor at Harvard, which is not exactly a hotbed of conservatism, I and mean, he is, of course, a Cuban immigrant as well. Immigrant Latinos are assimilating more slowly than they used to, thanks to progressive political policies. And part of the reason for that is, what are you doing back there? There's a very strange set of noises. You seem to, are you, are you trans hyena? <laughs> liberals, are, liberals are freaking out about Donald Trump. They are freaking out about, <laughs> yes, there we go. Daddy, they can't handle it. They don't like it. He's president, and what can they do about it? For the first time in recent memory, perhaps, an elected official is doing exactly what he said he was going to do. I mean, we, they probably thought that it was going to be all right, because we would vote for somebody, and we'd get what they got with Obama, which is somebody who Trump promised to close Gitmo and didn't do it. Um, or maybe they thought we'd get a male Hillary, who'd spend the first hundred days simply stealing whatever wasn't nailed down in the Oval Office. <laughs> But instead, but instead, they got a determined and crafty businessman who went to business doing exactly what he promised to do in the first place. It is their worst nightmare. A Republican who actually means what he says. You don't get it very often in politics in this country, but you do have one now, and he's in the White House. Now, you can't blame them for the mistake. The mainstream media called him a charlatan. Establishment Republican Cucks promised he was a leftist Democrat in disguise, but instead, he's daddy, and he's making America great again. Like any good businessman, the Donald knows that a one-size-fits-all solution fixes nothing. So he's addressing immigration problems in a number of different ways. Trump is about to put into place the temporary ban uh, he promised on immigration of any sort from selected Middle Eastern and African natures, uh, uh, nations like Syria and Somalia. And I can tell you, I'm not a citizen here, but I'm a visitor here, long-term visitor. Go home, good heavens. That's the, that's the sort of ugly attitudes you expect from Republicans. Some people find things like that quite offensive. I'm, a I'm, I'm merely a visitor here.
but I can tell you that I'm deeply comfortable with Trump's proposed ban, and you should be too. Because when you set aside the things that you must say to feel good about yourself and look instead at the facts, at the data, at the numbers, look. I mean, many of you don't have families yet, but you will do one day. And you imagine to yourselves what happens. And by the way, you know, some, you'll be insulated from some of this because you're college students. You'll be insulated from a lot of this because you, you will end up in socioeconomic brackets that protect you from the worst crimes. But the... That's all right, let them wear themselves out. They're like little energizer bunnies, you know. They hop up and down, not doing very much, and then eventually fall over, you know. <laughs> Nothing coherent to say. Okay. Um, the only sensible move before you know who is... I mean, you know, this country has been the victim of the worst terrorist atrocities anywhere in the world. And before you know who is who, it is sensible to draw a line under immigration from some places. Now, by this point, you'll, you'll wonder why I've been focusing so much on Islam. And it isn't just because it offends left-wingers. Um, it isn't just for the, these sorts of reactions, as much as I do enjoy them. Please keep them going. You're making me very, very wealthy. Um, I don't think they realize that this heats my pool. My God, what is that hat? Darling, we need a fashion check over there. What is... Oh, good heavens. What is that? Pink and yellow? Good Lord. <laughs> I know that the first time you got a TV, it was in black and white, but the rest of life is in living color, and this is not okay. No, only... Oh, she... Oh, you're leaving because you've been asked to. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it sad what happens to women who don't have sex? It's awful. It's awful. No, I feel for her because I'm a compassionate person. You know, I'm a Christian, or at least I try. I try. I feel for her. You know, it can only be five, six, seven years before she's found dead, stinking of cat piss. I feel for her. <laughs> Poor little lamb. Now, I don't just dwell on the subject of Islam because it offends liberals, although that is a wonderful side effect. Um, However, um, you know, I do enjoy that, and we will just carry on, but I, I think we should look at some data. So it turns out, on, on extensive number crunching, that yes, Muslims do blow things up more than other people. Um, and so, in light of this and Trump's election, we looked into some more data. Um, here's another chart. Um, percentage of illegals are going home. All of them, um, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, on the face of it, this shouldn't be difficult. You find out who wants to come to America. You ask them if they're dedicated to the destruction of capitalism and the Western way of life. More often than not, they'll tell you. <laughs> and you work out if they actually have anything to offer this country. It's so mystifying to me. I find this incredible. You know, this is, and I know I always say this, and I don't just say it to, for the nice reactions, but I really do mean it. Coming from Europe, you know, I'm so overawed by this country. It is the greatest nation in the history of human civilization. It's wonderful. But... But I sometimes wonder whether you know that. I sometimes wonder whether you know that. Particularly when, I, and it makes me very sad, you know, you hear some people outside my talk sometimes, you know, America was never great. Where the fuck would you rather be? Where would you rather be? Good Lord. Sometimes they'll try and be clever and they'll say Sweden. Oh, really? The rape capital of Europe. <laughs> would, you like to, uh, would you like to take a wild guess why Malmo in Sweden is now the rape capital of Europe? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Islamic immigration. Um, you know, anyway. I'm shocked by how few Americans realize what a great country this is and how few of them are dedicated to keeping it that way. Because you could choose anybody to come in. Just the fact that you share a border with somebody doesn't mean that you're automatically obligated to take food out of your own children's mouths and give it to someone else. That's fucking mental. Well, maybe on special occasions. 
That's Christian charity in action, rather than... A Christian charity, of course, enabled by the Protestant work ethic, in action, as opposed to taxation and redistribution by the state, which is what I'm talking about. But nice try. I think sooner or later they're just going to give it up. Um, but it mystifies me why Americans have, have sort of accepted. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think I know what it is. I think it's basically that your parents' generation of Republicans are spineless cunts. Um, and I think that the problem is they just, they just accepted that any disagreement can base, you know, they, they basically just have to concede ground to liberals so they don't get called racist. And liberals have worked out that this strategy works. And they're now so into this strategy, they realize how effective it is. You know, you could just call, and they've ramped it up now, they could white supremacists, anti semites all they can bogus fucking horse shit. Because they think it still works. They haven't cottoned on that with, you know, that they did that pretty regularly to Trump and dudes in the White House. Um, you know, it's like that. I think we might have got past that now. I think we might have got past the era when name calling was an acceptable substitute for argument. But your parents' generation of Republicans, your parents' generation, I just had pie charts. What are you talking about? <laughs> Your parents' generation of Republicans conceded almost every major issue because they didn't want to get called names by the left. And people are sometimes, you know, they sometimes accuse me of name-calling, which is a horrible allegation. Um, my, res my response to them is, well, first I do try to, to keep, unlike the uh, conspiratorial social justice left, do try to keep the main thrust of my speeches and, journal uh, and journalism closely anchored to the facts. But second of all, you guys have been lying to and lying about Republicans, calling them racist, sexist, homophobic, and all manner of other ludicrous allegations for 30 years, and you deserve some of it back once in a while. There are... If we, if we adjust for idiots um, in the room, there are a good couple of hundred of decent people in here nice, compassionate, ordinary, decent people who are pretty fucking tired of being called bogus names by people like you. So given the fact, given the fact that you run academia, you run the media, and you run the entertainment industry, if the worst you have to deal with is some British fag calling you a butch dyke, deal with it. Now, liberals have forgotten that old phrase, um, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. They don't have to know history to understand the threats to their own countries from immigration of all kinds. And I'm sure my, my loud friend over here is going to disagree with this wholeheartedly, and he's perfectly entitled to, in the Q&A. Um, but I've seen the London change. I've seen the way it look change. I've seen the, 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 how the streets look change in the last 10 years. In West London, where I spend most of my time, full veils carpeting the streets of Knightsbridge. I've seen it happen. And it's made me deeply and desperately uncomfortable. I don't expect everybody to agree with that assessment. You, think, you may think it's alarmist. But it is, I think, a fairly accurate um, depiction of how the streets of even the capital have changed. And the situation in some of Britain's smaller cities is even more dramatic. And the truth is that in many cases, nobody even knows what goes on there. Now, there was a big mistake, I think, on Fox News. I think one of your Fox News guys um, sort of said there were no-go zones in Birmingham or something like that. And every, everybody was very sort of loftily scoffing at him in England. So, of course, no, no, no-go zone goes in Birmingham. But there are elsewhere. The only thing he got wrong is the city. He only got wrong the city. If he'd said any number of maybe six, seven other British towns, he would have been perfectly right. He only got the city wrong. And that worries me a lot. And it worries me because... You know, everybody follows America. America is the greatest country in the world. We need you. We need you to be strong. We need you to be free. And if you aren't, we lose too. Some Americans are egotistical enough. I'm sorry to tell you, you know, the Constitution is pretty fucking great. But, but, it's not enough on its own. A piece of paper is not enough on its own. Don't think that you can import millions of people who do not share your values and expect your own history to affect how they behave when they get here. Fuck all that. Deus vult. Now, Paris used to be the jewel in Europe's crown. It's a very beautiful city if you've ever been to Europe. Um, London's obviously the best city in the world, um, by far. 
Um, New York, give me a break. Um, London is the best city in the world by any metric you care to, to name. Um, but Paris was always the prettiest one. You know, Paris is the jewel, because Paris is a planned city. London's so ancient, you know. Um, there's all these different areas, and you can walk, you know, for sort of ten minutes and go through ghettos to, like, glittering high-rises, office blocks, luxury building, whatever. Um, and London's kind of scruffy and messy, that's part of its charm. But Paris is a beautiful sort of neoclassical planned city. You go to the Arc de Triomphe, and there's a huge, sort of, all these roads sort of, you can see for miles, and everything is stunning, and you, go to this, you can do these same cruises, you know, the River Seine, you can go to the cruises, everything is beautiful, the only filthy things are the French. Um, you know, everything, all the buildings are lovely and, and glittery and wonderful, but this is, this, is, this is what some of it looks like now. Um, and and this, these pictures come up regularly in the press and people sort of try to fact check and say it can't possibly be Paris and, and, and it always is. Um, the alt-right Nazis in the audience um, probably be quite happy about that. Paris is starting to look like 1944 all over again. Um, but it isn't just France. It's Germany too. Um, and Sweden, of course, the rape capital of Europe. All these countries are having similar effects. And I don't want America to go the same way. Donald Trump knows that Syria should be made safe for Syrians, and he'll come up with all sorts of plans for that, I'm sure, instead of what you got from Barack Obama, who never works a day in the private sector in his life. And the reason that's personal, the reason it's, the reason it's worth pointing out, is that Trump seems to be taking a very sort of practical, common-sense approach to being president. I think he wants to get all the shit out of the way and then go back to Mar-a-Lago. Um, it's an impression you get from the sort of hyperactivity at the beginning. But he also seems to be learning from other world leaders. The David Cameron, the former prime minister in England, very intelligently and correctly, I think, in the Syrian crisis, said, well, we're not going to do what Germany did. We're not going to dramatically change our country to the point where female doctors are getting spat at and attacked uh, by migrants demanding male doctors. Because they can't wrap their head around the fact that a woman could be a doctor. We don't want to do that in England. We're going to help people where they are. So we might spend more than Germany does in the short term, probably not in the long term, but we might spend more than they do in the short term. We're going to help them where they are, rebuild cities, make sure they're fed and clothed and they have medical supplies. That appears to be the direction that Donald Trump is going in too, which is very, very smart. Now, going back to George Borges from Harvard, who gives us a few things to worry about. Nobody has any idea how many illegal immigrants are in this country. No one knows. And anyone who claims to know is lying to you. Government likes to say 11 million, but that's not math, it's just a sort of guess. Someone at some point estimated that 10% of, of immigrants were illegal, and they just stuck with it. In California, where they decided to issue driver's licenses to illegal immigrants, they had to double that number, double the number expected. So maybe the number is 20 million or 30 million. The truth is that nobody has any idea. You guys have absolutely no idea who's in your country because you have an effectively open southern border. Illegal immigrants often end up on welfare and public assistance. Now, Republicans, contrary to the characterization in the media, are not heartless people. But they do quite reasonably want to fix their own house first before they help others. And uh, Trump's insistence that you know, America first should be a good guiding principle for the next four years, again, isn't intended, I don't think, with any racial overtones, but simply means you have to get your own house in order before you can help other people. And for the last... For the last 15 years, the working classes in America have seen their living standards effectively stagnate. I spoke about this last night, uh, Colorado Springs. Um, things haven't really got any better for large swathes of the American population. For about 15 years, thanks to inflation, the liberals have been able to claim that things are getting better because the median household income is going up. But in real terms, people can't buy any more stuff than they could 15 years ago. So it's reasonable that they get upset when they see resources going to people who just shouldn't even be here. And there's no humanitarian or commonsensical reason why any of them should be in your country. It's perfectly reasonable when living standards are not improved. community in America, keeping wages down and actually just keeping them out of jobs altogether. Now, why should companies pay legal workers when they can get away with paying illegal ones? There's no sense to that. It's one of the small fault lines in capitalism. 
Now, in the spirit of Trump's agenda, I would like you to do something for me. This is the ICE hotline. And you can call this number if you suspect anybody of being an illegal alien. So I'd like you to think hard about working class people, about poor people. Think hard about the disabled who are desperately in need of, of state care. Think hard about students at uh, public universities who need of federal funding. And think hard, and mostly, about women and homosexuals, because d we love our women and we love our gays, don't we? led by my outfit this evening. I have not been appointed the head of Homeland Security yet. Um, but yesterday, Trump deported 90 Somalis and at least one Kenyan. I'm not talking about the uh, former inhabitant of the White House. Um, <laughs> and as for the Somalians, you're probably expecting me to make a black dick joke, but um, I'd have to be pretty drunk. Even I would have to be pretty drunk to go home with a pirate. Now, liberals love to say that illegal immigrants do the jobs Americans refuse to, but they don't get it quite right. They do jobs that Americans won't do without being paid a reasonable wage for them. And I'll share a case study with you. Meatpacking is not just a euphemism for butt sex. Um, it's, also, it's also about the dirtiest job you can do. Um, animals dying, a sea of blood and gore, rancid smells. It's a bit like the DNC. Um, now... <laughs> I would pass out in the first five minutes of my first shift. All of you should pray to God and thank your parents that you're in college instead of a meatpacking plant. It is exactly the type of jobs that liberals say only illegals will do. Well, a decade ago, and nobody really knows about this case, they were proven entirely wrong. A meatpacking company called Swift & Co. was raided by the government, who swooped in on six of their facilities, and 1,300 workers were, were taken and, and, and removed because they did not have papers to work. So what did Swift & Co. do? Well, they raised wages and hired Americans. Legal migrants, all kinds of documented workers got jobs. There is no job too dirty for an American to do. There are only wages too low, driven down by illegal immigration, globalization, and all of the other things that the Democrats and the establishment Republicans want to bring into this country. I could talk all night about jobs, finances, and government programs, um, but you're mostly young and you have no idea yet how badly you were screwed by previous generations. You will find out <laughs> later in life. Um, one thing you should care about is crime. And illegals bring it in in huge amounts, no matter what Vocative and Mike and BuzzFeed and, well, not Gawker anymore, but uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post will tell you. The FBI's National Gang Report from 2013 documented that in the southwestern border region, gangs consisting of up to 80% illegal immigrants illegal aliens were committing crimes including drug offenses, weapons trafficking, human trafficking, prostitution, extortion, robbery, auto theft, assault, homicide, racketeering, and money laundering. You are not under any obligation to let these people into your country. This headline, by the way, is from the Huffington Post. You'll hear people say that illegals commit less crime. You'll sometimes hear places like the Huffington Post say that illegals commit less crime than Americans. So all this talk of rapists and murderers and Trump is dumb. Well, you can crunch the numbers a number of different ways. But here's how I think about that. One robbery is one robbery too many. One murder is one murder too many. One rape is one rape too many. They just shouldn't fucking be here. Now, just like talking about economic statistics will bore you, talking about crime statistics will bore you too, and you can look up, you're perfectly capable, perfectly able to look them up 
yourself. What doesn't bore anyone is putting a face on Americans who've been killed by illegal aliens. They're Americans who didn't need to die, who ought to be alive today. Grant Ronnebeck was working in a convenience store when an illegal immigrant from Mexico named Apollinar Altimirano shot and killed him over a packet of cigarettes. Altimirano was out on bond while the government was deciding whether he should be deported for a previous conviction. Jamil Shaw was murdered by an illegal alien and gang member, Pedro Espinosa. The attack was completely unprovoked, according to the police. Espinosa was released from jail for assault with a deadly weapon just a day before this murder. Shaley Estes. Shaley Estes was killed by Igor Zubko, a Russian illegal immigrant. He kidnapped her and killed her. The police caught him before he could get on a plane to San Francisco. He was going there because the sanctuary law cities would have prevented his deportation. Sanctuary cities are an interesting problem for Trump, um, although it's one that he seems to be fixing quite well uh, already. Big cities suck up a lot of cash um, from the federal government, um, to basically for big government boondoggles. They don't seem to do very much good with the money. Um, San Francisco is a perfect example of that. But the Donald is smarter than the liberal mayors who are telling him that they refuse to obey the law. He has plans to expose just how bad sanctuary policies are. He's going to have a list published every week listing the crimes committed by illegal aliens. And if you think those cases are bad, <laughs> if you think those cases are bad, wait until you see them pouring out of the Trump administration fact-checked, I'm sure, not by the fake news, every single week. And wait until you see what happens when voters start seeing that stuff too. Of course, the fake news media won't report on any of it, but I'm sure it will be made available to you. Now, some of you may know I participated in an art show late last year. I was in, I was in no, it's not, it's not a sort of post-fisting selfie. It is, in fact, it is, in fact, a shot from an art show I participated in. I was bathing in a vat of pig's blood um, it was all perfectly hygienic and safe. Um, and I was surrounded by pictures of, of innocent Americans who had been killed by illegal aliens and Islamic terrorists. Um, and it wasn't solely for my own personal attention seeking, um, but it was also to draw attention. Well, you know, everyone can win at once. Um, <laughs> But it was also, you know, I, I did this not to denigrate the memory of, of, of these Americans, because who would? But I did it because I want them to be remembered, and I want people to think about it. And I want, um, I want the death to mean something. A signature campaign um, promise that Daddy has made that he's moving to fulfill already is one that we all know and love. He's building a wall. Now, you'll often hear from liberals that walls don't work. So I encourage you to think of the example of a country that the left has only just discovered it cares about, and only because a couple of Pepe avatars on the internet decided to make a few jokes. Liberals have pandered to radical Islam and denigrated Jews for decades, until this election when they realized it might be a useful cudgel with which to beat Donald Trump. They have suddenly rediscovered their love of the Jewish people. Um, well, let me, since they suddenly love Jews so much, to remind them about the most successful wall ever built. And it's this. <laughs> By the way, it works wonderfully. And Trump's wall will greatly diminish the flow of illegal aliens. There are people who claim the wall physically cannot be built, but give me a break. This is America. You can build whatever you want. You built the Ca Panama Canal using steam shovels and hard labor. I'm sure you can put up a few miles of wall. And the cost is a rounding error compared to Obamacare. Um, if you don't think Donald Trump can get Mexico to pay for it, think again. Mexico is governed by career politicians. And just like most countries, just like he did here, Trump will eat them alive. Speaking of walls, speaking of walls, we have a few legal hurdles to, to cross um, before I'm allowed to do this, but I'm intending to head, head down to uh, El Paso tomorrow and just get started. Um, I'm going to take my crew. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I do it, I'll let you know and I'll give you some notice because it's quite a long drive. Um, but we're just going to get some bricks from Home Depot um, and, and maybe a few laborers. Um, We'll give them the bill for the bricks afterwards. Um, we're going to get some bricks and some concrete. I'm going to get two types of bricks so I can put T's in it, you know, all the way. And then, you know, if we do a good enough job, they can just sort of 
carry on where we started off. So I'll let you know if we get round to it. Look, every country deserves to have control of its own border and decide who's allowed to come in. Wanting this doesn't make you racist, doesn't make you evil, or even particularly conservative. America is blessed to have two big oceans um, on either side, and Canada to the north, which I understand is a sort of culturally barren, snowy wasteland full of moose and transgender six-year-olds. Um, <laughs> But it has a large border to the south that must be controlled if America is to flourish. The millennial generation, in many respects, has been put in a very unfortunate position. We are expected, everyone in this room, to clean up the mistakes of previous generations in foreign policy, in trade, the economy, and in immigration. But if we can do it, if we can cast aside ludicrous allegations of racism from the progressive left and vote for common sense, as many of you already did in November, then perhaps things will get better. And similarly, if you can remember to... Uh, I'm only a visitor here, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, but I admire your country enormously. And I think that when America, I, I, it is true, you know, one of the things the neocons did used to, used to say that I think was fair and was true is that when America is strong, the rest of the world is strong. We need you, because if we don't have you, the, op the options are China and Russia. Not good. <laughs> so I encourage you, implore you, you know, this has been a contention. My college tour. You go back like a voice from the heavens. It's been some of the strongest language that I, I have ever used on a college campus. Um, but I, I did it because I want you to understand how serious the subject is and because I want you to feel confident, comfortable, happy, reassured that merely insisting that a country must be a country and a country is not a country unless it has borders and that the benefits of immigration are far from universally positive, and in fact, have really, really hurt a lot of Americans for a very long time. And that Donald Trump building his wall and taking a more sensible approach to the number of people that you let in, in particular, I beg you for, you know, on behalf of women homosexuals, don't do it. Don't become Germany, because if you do, America is done for. But I think there's a brighter future ahead than that. I think you're going to do it. Um, I mean, it's sort of amazing to me this country elected Donald Trump. I mean, I everybody's still kind of, really? But you did it. But you did it. And it was an expression of frustration in some degree. It was an expression of patriotism in some degree. For me, you know, sort of fixing trade, fixing immigration, and fighting my bete noire the scourge of political correctness, fighting for free speech and free expression, the right to joke about whatever you want, say, do, and be anything. All of these things were things that America urgently needed radical correction on. And maybe they needed correction as radical as Donald Trump. You um, haven't noticed, I don't suppose, because I haven't seen them either, the um, marauding right-wing death squads we were promised. It's in a lot of violence from the other side. Well, I have seen a country, uh, particularly you know, the libertarians and conservatives in this country, newly reinvigorated and, and encouraged and excited about being Americans. And there was always something, coming from Europe, there's always been something about Americans. You know, you're sort of struck by how American they are. Like, they're just really proud about America. They talk about it all the time, and they know stuff about their own country. And even people, perhaps, who didn't go to college, they listen to talk radio, and they know about politics. Like, they know who people are. You ask sort of, uh, you know, working class people in, in Britain, you know, some of them struggle to name who the Prime Minister is. But there's nobody in America who doesn't know who the President is. And that sounds silly, but Americans really care about the future of their country. They really care about how their country is organized, who has the power, what rights they have. They care about the First Amendment and the equally wonderful Second Amendment. They care about these things. For a while, it looked like you were about to go off a precipice. For a while, it looked as though you were about to go rogue. But you did claw it back. Um, thank you for listening to what I know for some people has been uncomfortable. Um, but there is nothing to be ashamed of in being proud of your support for Donald Trump. There is nothing to be ashamed of in the way that you cast your vote in the last election. And there is everything to be proud and hopeful about, about the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to be allowed some questions. Maybe Andrew will tell me. Yes? Yes, good. Okay. Now, I'm very happy to hear from the malcontents in the audience. I can't promise that you will leave satisfied, but let's try and have a constructive and friendly discussion with one another. So ask your question and then shut up. Um, and I will try to give you as best answer I can. It may not satisfy you. Um, let's listen to them respectfully. Um, you know, and if somebody says something really, really colossally thick, um, then we will allow ourselves a brief laugh before we return, before we return to, to, uh, to the, the good manners and etiquette for which conservatives are so rightly around the world known. Now, where, what's, the, what's the instructions? Do we have to come up here? No. No? I, I want to pick people. Okay, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Well, you don't necessarily get what you want just by yelling for it. Um, you're enthusiastic, the lady up here. I will come all the way around, I promise. Lady up, lady up here. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Wow. Um, hey. Hi. Uh, hi, Milo. Okay, so I wanted to hear about your opinion on freedom of speech. Obviously, this has mm -hmm. been an issue for our campus. Yes. Um, quite recently, Donald Trump tweeted out something about uh, giving people potential jail time if they burn the flag. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know, where do you think the line should be drawn in terms of free speech? Who draws that line? And... I mean, if it should be drawn at all, really. Sure. Um, I have to say, you know, we don't always agree 100% wholeheartedly with our parents, and I, don't, I think Daddy got that one wrong. Um, I, I think it is... I think it is unspeakable to burn a symbol of hope and freedom and capitalism, which is the best thing in the world. Um, I think it is... I think it is distasteful and disrespectful and odious and horrible, but I don't think you should go to prison for it. Um, I think you should be held up in the, to the court of public opinion and ridiculed for it. I think people should be allowed to express their opinions about it, as I just did, and we all move on with our lives. And hopefully, as we educate people better about what that flag means and what people sacrifice to keep it flying, um, fewer and fewer people uh, all the time will, will, move to, will, will be moved to do things like that. Now, Trump doesn't have a perfect record on free speech, so sometimes people do ask me these kinds of questions, and they're perfectly res reasonable questions to ask. For instance, he sometimes talks about clamping down on the, on, on the press a little bit more. Well, so my interpretation of what he said about libel was he was talking about malicious libel. He was talking about journalists who knowingly print untrue things, like Glamour magazine, uh, who called me a white supremacist. And the minute that my publicist got in touch with them, they changed it like that without even asking, which suggests to me that they probably knew it wasn't true when they printed it. Now, that's malicious libel, and that comes with pretty heavy jail sentences. It's a really bad thing to do. Now, you can still be held accountable for, you know, the First Amendment, First Amendment you know, doesn't cover everything. And that's a pretty bad thing. And it's my interpretation that he meant if people knowingly print untrue things. It was very clear that the press has sort of system systematically failed in this country, the system-wide failure, which is precisely the sort of situation where the government does sometimes step in in industries that have um, you know, widespread systemic failure. I don't mind his suggestion of strengthening punishments for malicious libel. I think it would have a good effect on the press, but I can't honestly agree with putting people in prison for burning the flag. I suppose the only... I try to think of myself as a free speech fundamentalist. The only... Um, I suppose the only real objection, and I haven't really reconciled this myself, um, is when it comes to Islam, because I think there are, there are, there are situations um, in which, you know, that sim simply wildly untrammeled free speech cannot be allowed. You cannot, for instance, directly incite people to commit violent acts, you know? You can't um, stand up on a, you know, with a microphone like this, and I, you know, I can't tell all of you people to go and attack a particular member of the audience. That would be illegal, and it should be. It should be illegal. Um, I struggle with how freely people should be able to preach... Um, that particular faith in this country, given that Omar Mateen, for instance, who killed 49 of my lot and, 50, and injured 50 more of them, was radicalized in a mosque just north of Orlando, a place called Sanford, or Stanford, I think, um, which hosts preachers who say things like, the compassionate thing to do is to murder all homosexuals. I wonder whether that ought to be protected um, by the First Amendment. I don't know. But on the question of the flag, I think he was wrong. As ugly as it is, and I, as much as I wish people wouldn't do it. I don't think you should put, them, put, put people in prison for it. Uh, next question. Let's go with you at the back there, the gentleman up there. Yeah. 
Wait until you get the microphone, because everyone can hear you, sweetheart. Hey, Milo. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for protecting the First Amendment. Well, thank, thank you. you. It really matters, you know, and a lot of people who live in this country don't realize that it does, and they don't know why it does, because they don't realize that freedom doesn't just get inherited. You have to fight for it with every single generation. You, know, you have to re-earn it every single generation. A lot of Americans don't seem to get that. I do want to ask, though, mm -hmm. in Trump's Muslim ban, yes. he's banning people from Iraq and uh, Libya, two countries to be destabilized, but he's mm -hmm. letting Saudi Arabians come in, and yes. you know, that's the home of Wahhabism. So yes. that's my question. Thank that's you. That's wrong. You should just blanket Muslim ban, in my view. Um, Saudi Arabia is the last country we should be giving special privileges to after you know, the amount that they fund terrorism. Um, Saudi Arabia is, you know... <laughs> you know, politics isn't all about, you know, perfect worlds, and you have to make in some cases, as anyone who's seen 24 will know, um, you know, horrible compromises sometimes, but I think that's a, a bridge too far, and I would love to see a president who actually took a stand against Saudi Arabia. Um, maybe later in his presidency he will. Um, he should. Um, yes, all right, this gentleman here. Okay. All right, no need to be so passive-aggressive about it. You're the one yelling. First of all, these people drove from Houston for this show. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you very These much for coming. Right thank, here. You. thank you. Okay. I write a lot of comments on Breitbart. I'm pretty high up there in the comment like <laughs> area. Well, thank you. Uh, I wrote one whenever they had the UC Davis riot that shut you down. Yes. And I was second from the top. It said, was an Ahmadinejad invited to speak at Columbia? And he wanted to wipe a whole country off the map. Why are you a danger? Whenever they had this guy that wanted, he was killing Americans mm -hmm. in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Okay, my other comment on this immigration. Immigrants from all over the world leave their country because of the corruption and the lack of rule of law in their country to come here to a country envied for its rule of law. Then they demand that we break our laws for them, therefore becoming the lawless country they just left. We need to enforce our laws. And what is, if you go down there, you're going to be hung from a bridge. So that's what's going on across the border. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're um, right on that last point, and I touched on it briefly in my speech. And you see this, I mean, people say this is ridiculous, you know, but... But then you start to read, um, you know, what few stories emerge about this stuff, about sort of parallel justice emerging, you know, Sharia courts being tacitly endorsed by the British justice system. Sharia, of course, being the system in which, under many circumstances, a woman's testimony is valued at half of that of a man. Sharia law, of course, supported by the woman who organized the women's march in D.C. a few days ago. The idiocy of American progressives, how utterly fucking preposterously dumb they are. They believe that they believe that a symbol of female emancipation is women walking in hijabs who support Sharia law. This stuff, and this is my problem with, you know, this is, this is my great First Amendment dilemma, which I'm as, as yet unresolved, is that when you see people who come in here and actively agitate for parallel justice systems and who sort of collaborate with liberal idiots to create new classes of crime, like hate crime. I've said this before, and, and you know, it's sort of funny-ish, but it makes it a proper point. Um, hate crimes you know, mean effectively that it's more of a crime to punch me than it is to punch some straight person in the audience, right? Um, if you can convince somebody that, oh, it's because I was gay, you know, which is sort of in the eye of the whatever. Well, it's obviously ridiculous. I'm way more punchable than most of you. I probably had it coming if I got hit, you know? But what definitely shouldn't happen, yeah, okay, we agree on something. Um, <laughs> but what probably shouldn't happen is, you know, that the same crime per perpetrated by the same person can carry different sentences depending on who they do it to. That's a sort of weird parallel justice that does away with the principle of equal equality before the law. 
And this is the sort of thing we see with Sharia courts popping up. And this is also, I have to say, the sort of thing that we see um, on campuses with Title IX legislation. Um, and so, you know, it's a wider problem than just an immigrant problem. It is a, it is a problem with, with the way that progressives see the world, casting out reason and fairness and equality and logic in favor of identity politics. Um, it's not, not something we can get into in great detail today, but it is noxious and poisonous, and it is what happens when you throw out idea and principle and you replace it with ego and personal identity. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you were quite right in both the things you said. Uh, let's go to... No, you've got a MAGA hat on, so you're going to be nice to me. I want to find someone who's not going to be nice to me. Who's not going to be nice to me? You? Okay, you're not going to be nice to me. No, she, she's not going to be nice to me. No, go on. Well, I, I, I'm very happy to ask you a question, but are you going to be well-behaved? Are you going to be well-mannered? <laughs> what? Like this whole talk? Oh, snap. So w is, your definition, is your definition of me going low and you going high, you continually interrupting a lecture and refusing to wait until the Q&A? Actually, I was speaking. No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, and, and before you start bleating about freedom of speech, I enforce one rule and one rule only in my Q&As, and that is good manners. Somebody else. Yeah, uh, the guy here, the guy here. Milo? Huh? Oh, yeah, no, no, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, go, go. go. You, said you, you said you were going to be unpleasant too, so go ahead. No, no, I promise I'll be nice to you. Oh, no, no, I don't want you. Oh, come on, you've got such... I can't say no to that hair. Go ahead. So my brother and I actually flew in from Las Vegas, Nevada, to see you. It's really great to be here. So well, you thank you very much. Thank you. So, great to be here. Um, so, just two questions. Will we ever see you meet Daddy? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you know that hasn't happened? Um, I, I, will tell you one, I will tell you one thing before you go to your second question. Um, I'm not particularly keen to nail my sort of fortunes to any political administration. And I will tell you something very sincerely. The only reason I like Trump is because he isn't like other Republicans. I don't particularly like many other Republicans that have come before him. Um, and if I were doing what I do now in the 90s, I probably would be going for the jugular of the religious right because I felt that they represented the same threat to free expression and free speech and so told some similar lies to the ones that the progressive left does today. They were saying then that video games and, and music could, could kill, could turn you into to a violent person. Now the progressive left is saying video games can make you sexist and a rapist. I mean, both of these propositions are ludicrous and unsupported by any evidence whatsoever. What I like about Trump is he's sort of blowing up all of that. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel an urge to, I don't, I don't sort of crave proximity to power. And I don't feel an urge, to, I prefer money, uh, and I don't, I don't feel an urge to, to sort of pin my fortunes to a particular political administration. But obviously, many people in his circle are, are good friends. Okay, so that kind of being said, it kind of answers the second question, but would we ever see you run for a position in... God, no, are you kidding me? <laughs> you think I survive as a politician? No, no, there's so many skeletons in my closet, that's why I had to get out of it. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Milo. That's why I had to leave. One more. Oh, two more. Okay, fine, fine, fine. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not for me. I don't like politicians at all. And I don't like politics. Let's do... Um, I'm not really interested in politics. Uh, you have a lot of people pointing at you. So let's do it. Yeah, do, let's, yeah don't, don't be proud of that hat. Um, just stand up and ask your question. I knew we'd get a Federer. What do you call it? Fedora here? You've got a Fedora here. Yeah. Thank you for your kind words. Um, You're welcome. Also, you know, thank you for coming to the university and, and sharing your thoughts. Where are you from? I'm from Midlands uh, Worcester, or something. just south of Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do disagree with some of the ways that you characterize the UK. That's and okay. Germany, for that matter, where, that's okay. I, where I was living before here. But that's not what I want to focus my question on. I, uh, I teach here at the university. I'm a PhD student in philosophy, and I do critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And with my class this week, we addressed the, the issue of kind of this post-truth politics and, and what that might entail and, and whether it's there. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the question of free speech. Now, I entirely agree with you that free speech is important in our society. And I think everybody in this room it agrees with that by virtue of being here. Mm -hmm. I actually sit on the left of the political spectrum. Sure. And I'm here because I believe that part of free speech is also the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you.
the angry young lady up here could learn a thing or two. Perhaps you should enrol for your classes. <laughs> now, given that, my first question, which I'll probably want to follow up on, All right. is do you think there has been a, let's say, an issue with free mm -hmm. speech and truth over the last year? I mean, Oxford said, you know, it's the word of the year, it's kind mm -hmm. of the, the, the most the recent post -truth popular, thing. popular yeah. word. And whether, whether truth is important in politics anymore. Mm. This might be my fault, because I was talking to a Bloomberg Businessweek who did this big profile on me ages ago. And it's okay, he's all right. Um, Bloomberg Businessweek did this big profile on me ages ago, and I dropped into discussion in the course of like two days, this, this phrase, uh, post-truth era. And what I meant by it, what I was trying to say, was the facts are no longer enough. You have to also be persuasive and charming and funny and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, that's what I meant by post-truth post-fact era, whichever it was that they picked up. Um, and sort of, it sort of went gangbusters after that. Um, certainly there seem to be two emerging sets of truths in America, and it's, it, it, they're split, on fairly, split fairly evenly down political lines, aren't they? Um, and it's quite disturbing uh, in some ways to sort of see that the different versions of the universe described by, let's say, the New York Times and Breitbart, for instance. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's been a problem with truth, but I... I'm unconvinced that it is the conservative or libertarian side of the argument that has the problem. Um, I think that the conspiratorial um, mythologizing about campus rape culture and the wage gap, the imperviousness to reason and fact that the, that the progressive left has demonstrated over the last 30 years is far more of a risk to democracy and to, to the pursuit of truth than anything that Trump has done in the last year. I think that you know race baiting mixing up statistics, selectively quoting statistics, lying about individual cases and, and, and misreporting for ideological reasons around Black Lives Matter, the police and race, has done far more damage to America than Donald Trump sort of vacillating on various things. So I think that I think there's been a sort of bifurcation in Ameri Americans and the sort of news sources, the people they trust and where they get their news from. Um, this is ultimately not going to be particularly helpful for the pursuit of truth or for democracy. But um, I think it's still, I mean, it's, it's, it's fake news is still primarily perpetrated by the left. Uh, given that, may I ask a couple of questions to you? Why don't you do one, because then somebody okay. else can have a chance. Yeah, no, so pick absolutely. your best one. Pick okay. your best one, and then I'll, so, I'll, I'll um, move on to someone else. Whilst I don't want to disagree that the left also reports on fake news and mm -hmm. focuses on certain statistics and not others, which is why I attempt to read everything in a world that's increasingly impossible to do that. Mm. Uh, but puts, you in, a, puts you in the minority on your side of the uh, political divide, so you must get some fair credit for that. <laughs> um, uh, focusing, I guess, on, on your paper that you work for. Uh, now, if the CIA came to us and said, and I, I do want to pose this to everybody in the room, and I'm, I'm more than open for a, uh, a different interpretation, but if the CIA came to us and they said 97% of us agree that ISIS has developed a weapon that could wipe out you know, vast portions of America and destabilize our ecosystem for the next generations to come, would we want to do something about that? And you know what I'm getting at with You're this question? Is this climate change? Precisely. Right. So we have 97% so, no, 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 no. of the be scientific nice. community. Be nice. So, be nice. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy and to I, I would love to hear your response on this. You know, fine. I believe in a political well, spectrum we can have this. Fine, fine, but when 97% of scientists sure. say this, okay. and then the Trump administration removes any question of climate change from the website mm -hmm. and says that that's not an issue they want to address for the future, you know, well, I can say okay. there are different political issues that I I understand ways the of solving it. I understand the question. That they can do I that, understand. but if they erase that discussion, I get really worried for even having a family in the future. And I'd love to hear your response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I don't have a problem with the Trump administration focusing away from environmental issues about which the United States can do nothing compared to China um, and towards things like trade and immigration, focusing on things that matter rather than identity politics. So I was very happy to see the gay bit of the White House website disappear. We're doing fine. We're doing fine. Like, focus on stuff that actually matters. Like, help the rest of the country fix the fucking economy, you know? And make sure that people can be, do, and say whatever they want. So I wasn't worried about seeing climate change disappear because there's not a huge amount that America can really do about it with, with China, with China and, and, and India anyway. As to your question, you're sort of invoking a lot of authorities there. So if the CIA said that 97%, well, you hit upon something interesting. I saw um, a video of somebody I wouldn't expect to agree with under normal circumstances, of Glenn Greenwald on the BBC sort of completely confounding this reporter by saying, yes, intelligence agencies have bias. 
Intelligence agencies sometimes go on political crusades. Intelligence agencies sometimes lie. Shocking, I know. Um, and I think there's a sort of, there's a, we have this habit, and it's increasingly, I think, a good, a good thing that we're breaking out of this habit of just believing what people tell us if they hold particular positions and we don't dig any deeper. Well, I worked for a climate change NGO in Germany for over a year. And I was there when the IPCC reports were being drafted. I was there in uh, Bali for um, Al Gore's speech. Saw him land in his private jet with his retinue of seven, ta uh, I think they were Tahoes. Were they Tahoes? Maybe they were Suburbans. Um, seven of them, you know, green-fingered Al Gore. I was, I was there for all of that. And I saw the level of politics over science that actually goes on. And I saw... I was in the room with scientists who gerrymandered numbers to fit political agendas. And I have to tell you, um, if 97% of any group tells me that something is the case, that makes me deeply suspicious. Because 97% is way too many. Nobody, no issue is agreed upon by 97% of people. Nothing. Not elections. Nothing. When 97... All right, well, let's say, content let's say contentious hypotheses or, you know, uh, matters for discussion, sure, okay. But when something like climate change, which is by no, you know, in, in no sense settled, 97% of scientists is actually a cause for suspicion and alarm for me. And indeed, we know from University of East Anglia and all kinds of other things, just how many obfuscations and manipulations have been made in climate change. The problem is that your side, if I can put it like that, um, made a, a, a PR error in selling climate change to people. You were hysterical about it. It was like a religion. And, well, it's like a re The problem is that when you're so hysterical and when you punish people for disagreeing, and this is where the free speech element comes in, when you ridicule and punish people for stepping outside of the progressive orthodoxy, when you turn people into laughing stocks or cost them their jobs because they don't agree with you about something, you start to lose sympathy. That's what the progressive left... And that, that, that actually is, is a characteristic, a classic characteristic of all the groups I hate. Black Lives Matter do it. Feminists do it. In fact, feminists have lost. You know, fewer than one in five American women now calls herself a feminist. Why? Because they're such cunts. <laughs> Not because of they, 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 most women don't want to get into the statistics about campus rape. They don't care. But they just know that they don't want to be like those feminists because they're quite like a boyfriend one day and ugh. So, you know, the, the problem is you, 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 you really, you goofed up trying to sell this to the public because you bullied them instead of persuading them. And the situation now is that people simply don't believe the established authorities that are supposed to be there to tell us things. And that situation has replicated itself across society. And that, I think, is a more interesting way of looking at sort of post-truth, post-fact societies. That breakdown of, of, of trust and, and belief in, in authority structures, that is the fault of no one but those authority structures themselves. Politicians have fucked themselves. The media has fucked itself. Ed higher education has fucked itself. And scientists have fucked themselves. The only people who believe scientists uncritically now are left-wing journalists. That's a real problem. And I can tell you... And I can tell you, you, you were quick to invoke your own life experience, you know, living in Germany, coming from England and disagreeing with my characterizations. Well, I can tell you from working in a climate change NGO, I don't trust those cunts as far as I can throw them. I think we can do one more. Uh, let's do... Yeah, all right, this... Sorry? Hello, darling. Uh, no, who's who's going to be mean to me? Who's going to be mean? Do you promise to be mean? You're going to be mean? Okay, the guy in the blue shirt. There we go. What? Okay, okay. Uh, oh, he's over there. Now, he's promised to be vicious. I expect to be satisfied by the end of this. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Just kidding, kidding. <laughs> So you actually hit on the, the political savage around the globe. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be mean, but I do have a question which ties into that answer. Could you speak up for us? Uh, 
my question ties into the answer which you just gave about the political correctness around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, with the vote against establishment Brits with Brexit, the increase in the number of elected right-wing politicians in Germany against Mar Angela Merkel's election, immigration policies, and now the election of Donald Trump, where do you see the global perception of political correctness heading, and how do you see it as a global unspoken revolt against governments and how they've gone too far with telling people how to live? That wasn't a mean question at all. I'm sorry. I feel very let down. It's like ordering a blonde hooker and something ginger showing up. <laughs> We've all been there. Um, well, I'm very... Did you say there's a ginger over there? Oh, God. You should, you should back away slowly and check his, <laughs> check his pockets. If he, if he, if he want, if, you know, if you see his phone ringing mysteriously, or he comes home one day with friends called Abdullah and Hussein, you need to start, you need to start keeping a close eye on him. He's in a risk category. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to see um, voters in the UK and in the US soundly and enthusiastically reject establishment, globalist elites and authorities. Very happy about that. They're right to do so. They're right on most of the issues too, by the way. I mean, the progressive left is this sort of great cultural hegemony from, from, from the left and they, they've sort of forgotten how to argue and they've wandered themselves into really ludicrous positions with these strange definitions of racism, these strange definitions of sexism, the lies they tell about people, um, the, you know, the lies they tell to people all the time. Um, it's very worrying and they deserve a good kick in the teeth. I worry a little bit about some of the populist movements in Europe. So I think, you know, Brexit, fine. There's no racist party in England. That was destroyed when, when Nick Griffin went on, on the BBC, so the BNP is gone. UKIP is a perfectly respectable, reasonable, good party, and Nigel Farage is awesome. Um, and Brexit was a thoroughly good thing, and Trump's election is a good thing. But I do wonder, and it's not something I pay a huge amount of attention to, because it's, it's sort of outside my, my area of interest. I do wonder how much the movements like AFD in Germany and Front National in France are based on high-minded ideals, um, like Republic, you know, like sort of a Republican dedication to the Constitution, and how much of it might be racially charged. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm a little bit more hesitant, encouraging, and celebrating Marine Le Pen, for instance, than I am Donald Trump. Um, so, well, would that be nice? Would that be nice? Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I sort of think that the political revolution, I'd quite like to see it stop. <laughs> I'd quite like to see it sort of finish up where it is. I know that many of my colleagues at Breitbart won't agree with that, and they have very, very persuasive and powerful arguments, and, and they will probably end up convincing me, and, and if you ask me in six months, I'll probably have a different view on this. One of the reasons we're opening an office in France is to better educate the rest of us. Um, so I don't, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling that the, you know, the ones that are completely defensible have happened already. What I now want to see, and this is what you guys are here for, um, is now that you have been emboldened and you know, now you're able to say and do what you want under a Trump administration, now you are energized and, and, and sort of reignited in your passion for freedom of speech, capitalism, property rights, and all the kind of stuff that made this country awesome. Now that you've got all that stuff. customary to learn how to pe pronounce people's names before you heckle them, but, but I'm glad you're having fun. Now it's time for you to go. Um, what? You think I mean... Right? Is he sort of... Um, These peculiar, nonsensical slogans they keep shouting because they don't have any arguments left. It's very depressing. I feel sorry for you. It's very important to have strong interlocutors. It's very important to have strong enemies. You know, we want to know that we're definitely right. And at the moment, there's just no intellectual opposition whatsoever because all they do in the face of different facts and arguments is going, hey, hey. Um, it's, I feel for you guys. I do. I do. Um, okay, I'm, no, I was thinking to myself the other day, actually, um, in a rare moment of narcissism, um, that I was probably the most interesting person in America. But what would be even more interesting if I had a really strong 
adversary. If I had that, you know, some you know, like sort of Gore Vidal, William F. Buckley kind of like lifelong rivalry. You know, somebody I could grow with intellectually and have big debates, and sometimes they win and sometimes I win. Someone's actually good enough to go toe to toe with me on TV, like week in, week out for years, and I just can't fucking think of anyone. Somebody on the left, well, maybe Shapiro, yes. Um, <laughs> that's very mean of you, very mean of you, poor, poor Ben. Poor little Ben. I've told him I'm happy to do it. I mean, he's now, he's now bedded himself into this lie that I backed out of it. Like, you know. What's that? Well, Glenn Beck is definitely on the left, but, I, you know, I don't like to intrude on private grief nor bully the disabled, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure it would be fair for me to appear in a TV studio with him. I mean, he was close enough to suicide after Ted Cruz U-turned. I think after losing, losing to somebody he called a danger to the Republic and the reincarnation of Goebbels, if he were to lose to someone like that in a debate, he really would finish himself off. It would be down into the bowl of Cheetos and never up again. Um, so, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I'd be perfectly happy. Look, I'm happy to talk to anybody. I mean, I'm not always going to be the smartest person in the room, normally, but not always. Um, I'm not always going to be, you know, I'm not always going to win every debate. I'm not always going to answer every question as, um, uh, as, as, as brilliantly as I did his. But, um, I'm very happy to debate anyone. Um, what tends to happen to me, though, is that people agree to and then back out, claim that I was the one that backed out, and then never respond to emails. So you can read between the lines on that one. Um, I think we're done. Thank you very much. It's been lovely. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please stay at your seats for just a moment for us. Thank please you stay much. at your seats. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks for coming out this evening. Um, the, the various police departments who are here helping us out did a fantastic job getting everyone in safely. So now we're going to allow them to do a great job getting on everyone out safety. And the first step in that is we need everyone to sit down. So as, we're, as we go through the next couple minutes, uh, the, the officers here are, are going to uh, let you know the process for getting out and how to do that and, and make sure you folks all get home safely. Thanks again for coming out this evening. I probably won't be as entertaining.
girls were raped in racially or religiously, as you choose to define it, motivated crimes because both the police and the authorities were too scared of being called racist to intervene. And this pattern repeats itself everywhere there is mass Muslim immigration. My suggestion to you, America, is that you don't need it here. Learn your lesson from 9-11. Learn your lesson from Orlando. These socially regressive, oh, obviously they walk out when they don't like the facts. These socially regressive attitudes. These socially regressive attitudes of Muslims in the West are horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. The surveys show that 52% of British Muslims think that my sex life should be made illegal. 39% of them. Why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? Don't you want to talk about numbers? Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed of the hateful culture that surrounds your religion, that oppresses women and murders homosexuals and commits unspeakable acts of terrorism? Are you ashamed of it? Would you like to talk to us about why there's no global Muslim peace movement? Because I don't hear, I hear lots of very upset people at my talks complaining about statistics they can't refute. I don't hear a lot of Muslims standing up against terrorism. The problem, the problem is that, um, the problem is, to give an example, Hillary Clinton took $140 million from Saudi Arabia. You can't really expect anyone in the Democrat Party uh, to speak up about this stuff. And after Orlando, they didn't. And this guy was homegrown, and this is another very worrying thing. The Pakistani Muslims in, um, in the UK are becoming less integrated, not better integrated, as successive generations grow up. The UK now sends more fighters to ISIS than any other country with the exception of Belgium, which has a huge Islamic radical problem. So there's something different. You know, you hear occasionally when people say, oh, well, you know, the UK, you know, United States is a nation of immigrants, and, and the UK is a nation of immigrants. Well, yes, that's true to a point, but the immigration we have now looks a little different to the immigration from the past. The Irish and the Italians who came in, many of whom, are, you know, particularly in New York, they came here because they want to participate in the American dream. But Islamic immigration to Germany and to the UK, and I'm sorry to say it's beginning here too, and I come as a warning from Europe desperately trying to persuade you not to allow this to happen since you haven't learned your lesson from 9-11, you haven't learned your lesson from Orlando, is don't allow these people to come here who do not wish to participate in the American dream and to, turn their, and to make their, their lives better for themselves and for their families, but want to turn America into the shithole they came from. Amen. Don't do it. One hundred percent of Muslims in a survey done by Channel 4, a left-leaning broadcaster, said that they found homosexuality an unacceptable lifestyle choice. One hundred percent. That's more than Palestine, where it's 97%, which liberals also love to, <laughs> love to stick up for. Never mind the fact that if you're gay, the only place you would dare to be in the Middle East is, of course, Tel Aviv. Now, if you want to see a real display of racism, um, you, know, you might want to find one of your Hispanic friends who support Trump, who dares to speak out that they support Trump, and you'll see a real freak out. You'll see a, you'll see a sheer, there we go. You will see from liberals Shia LaBeouf levels of spurging out when you discover a homosexual or Hispanic or a woman or, or heaven for fen, somebody black, who likes Donald Trump. They'll be called all sorts of names, and believe me, I've been called all of them. So, what's that, doing? Oh, you're good. So the other argument we run into, as you know, this, this America is a nation of immigrants, you know. You, you, have it on, you have it on your statue, you know, you have it on there. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled. Masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. And there is some truth, there's a lot of truth, to both the UK and the US being refugees. But many of the people coming over here are not refugees. They're migrants, they're economic migrants. And many of those are people who come here with very unpleasant intentions. And your law enforcement are tied and hamstrung 
I can't imagine what it would be like to be a border officer in Obama's America. I mean, you can imagine what these guys go through. Trying to, try, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> imagine what these guys go through. But as I say, immigration looks a little different today than it did whether in the ancient past or as recently as 1940 or 50. Now, your families keep various traditions from the old country. If you have some Irish ancestry, which I think every American I've ever met claims to be Irish. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you actually are. Um, but immigrants of the past, as I say, they want to be American. I don't understand, you know, why anybody would want to turn this country into Syria or Somalia. Why come here if you just want to bring your origin country with you? Why would anyone want that? And I'll give you an example. The uh, Sanev brothers who committed the Boston bombing. They were, of course, Muslim asylum seekers. And Zokar was a naturalized citizen while Tamilan was still waiting to be naturalized. Don't be misled by the names. These were Muslim asylum seekers. And these thugs were not people who wanted to be American. Tamilan used to tell people um, to turn off music because he says it was not permitted by Islam. And additionally, they were long borders, which explains even more than <laughs> the religion. But one thing is clear. This sort of, well, what we saw over there, sadly, brainwashed women. This is not something that should ever appear on a citizen of the United States. This should never be seen in America. It's a symbol that the wearer has decided to stand back from American values, from the, from the things that made this country extraordinary. <laughs> All the same people until they come at you in a bomb vest. All the same people and thing you disagree on, they will call you a racist. But illegal immigrants aren't a race. They're people who don't belong in your country. And we know that the... There's this sort of weird idea through this whole election that, um, you know, talking about the fact that crime comes from a particular place has sort of racial overtones. Well, it doesn't. And here's a sort of dirty secret that I would like to reveal to you, Americans. Hispanics are white. I'm sorry to break it to you. Progressives in your country have done this weird job of breaking everyone down into categories, whether it's by sexuality, skin color, like whatever it is. They want to sort of break you all apart and set you against each other. Well, I'm from Europe, and let me tell you, Spaniards and Portuguese people, you know, our neighbors in Europe would not be considered anything but white. It's an invention of the American psyche that these people, because they have slight, a different culture and slightly different skin color, must be considered a special category. They're not. They're like you. They just belong somewhere else. And the idea that there's some sort of racial overtones to this comes out of this progressive insistence that any patriotism, any belief in the Constitution, America, American values, capitalism, property rights, freedom, freedom of speech, must necessarily be somehow to do with race. But they did that. You didn't do that. Republicans didn't do that. Libertarians didn't do that. The left did that. And the left did that as part of their insane and endless quest to divide people up. It always mystified me as a European why Americans buy this stuff about, oh, no, I'm not white, I'm Latino. It's just weird, so get the fuck over it. Really, America. I mean... We don't have the problems with, we don't have the same sort of racial conflict in Europe that you have here. We had slavery. By some measures, we invented it. We also brought it to an end sooner. But we don't have the kind of racial conflict in Britain that you have here. And part of the reason for that is that we haven't had a very strong progressive left element in the media and in politics constantly reminding people of how they're different and constantly race baiting. There are no Al Sharptons or Sean Kings or DeRay Mackesons in the United Kingdom. Because people understand in Britain that what you think and who you are is more important than your skin color. And it's very peculiar, it's very peculiar to me. It's very peculiar to me that... And you're entitled to in the Q&A, pipe down. We don't have the kind of racism that does happen here. Of course, you know, most of the time the racism in America is moving in the opposite direction of the one you're told it does. For instance, that video in Chicago of four people torturing 
a mentally ill white kid shouting, fuck white people and fuck Trump, which the police wouldn't even categorize as a hate crime, not because they're incapable of seeing that it is one, but because they're scared of what will happen if they do. You're right up there. Somebody really should get you some pills. You should have some of the meth. <laughs> but I wish that people would stop talking about racism unless they're actually talking about other races. In the same way that you should not extend civil rights frontier to cross-dressers and reserve it where it belongs for black people and the emancipation of black people, you should similarly keep discussions of racism for prejudice between races. Now, I'll tell you something else that isn't a race that America is going to have to deal with in the next decade, and that is Islam. Now, Muslims can be from the Middle East, from Africa, and they can even be soulless gingers from the United Kingdom. Um, now, there's a... I wrote a piece about this, and nobody believed me at the time. Nobody thought I was telling the truth, and it was called um, Attack of the Ginger Jihadis. Um, no, 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 it's very true. There is, statistically, if you, it, so we did, a, we did a survey of the literature, because the, so the, the think tanks know about this, but they won't tell you, and the police sort of will sort of nod at you if you're a journalist and sort of say, well, yeah, we have noticed that, but we can't tell you anything about it. Um, basically, the, the gin, people with red hair are vastly more likely um, to, to convert to radical Islam. So white, the, 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 the technical uh, explanation, the, sorry, the, te the, te the technical, the precise trend is white British converts to radical Islam are vastly disproportionately likely to be red-headed by, by an order of magnitude, like many, many multiples. And there are some, uh, nobody really knows why it is. It could be that uh, they get discriminated against so they look for a club to be a part of, or it could be that gingers are just genetically predisposed toward terrorism. Nobody knows. Um, but, <laughs> But it, but it is true, but they, ca they can look like this. You know, there's a, this sort of hook-handed cleric um, in, in England um, who has a sort of harem of ginger groupies uh, you sometimes see on the news. Um, anyway, like any set of ideas, Islam, uh, Islam is it's like a religion. It's any set of ideas. It deserves to be scrutinized. Well, I have scrutinized it, and I have found it wanting. I have found it lacking. Everywhere there is Islam, you will find women oppressed. Everywhere there is Islam, you will find... You're wearing a hijab in the United States of America. What is wrong with you? You see, they want to shout you down by saying, oh, what about me? I'm not so oppressed. Well, let's take, let's move on from women. If you don't care about female genital mutilation, don't care about forced marriages, don't care about acid thrown in the faces of your Islamic sisters, if you don't care about any of those things, fine. Let's talk about gays instead. In 12 Islamic countries, I could be killed for my sexuality. Is that okay? People, 100 million people live in countries where it is illegal to be homosexual. All of those countries are Islamic. This is not an ISIS thing. You know, you will see gays being thrown off the roof in ISIS-controlled territories. But this has nothing to do with terrorism. This is mainstream Muslim culture. Your religion does it everywhere your religion exists. It is a threat, an existential threat to gay people. Everywhere in the world there is Islam. You will find women oppressed, homosexuals murdered, you will find gang rape. Now, there's a unique phenomenon that it doesn't really exist outside of Islamic cultures, of familial gang rape, where fathers, brothers, and cousins go out raping people together. It happened in Rotherham in the UK. And the liberal establishment in the UK didn't investigate this because according to a government report, not a far right-wing blog, um, according to a government report, 1,400 young girls about you. Um, if you have an opinion they don't like, if you uh, express a political position that doesn't cohere with theirs, they will accuse you of all sorts of ugly, horrible things. And hate speech is one of the ways they try to shut down speech on campus. But your university, to its great credit, the University of New Mexico, has reaffirmed its commitment to free speech. Not only, not only has it declined to close this event down, but it also very sensibly waived um, a last minute, a large last minute security fee. This is one of the ways that campuses try to impose censorship by the back door um, on conservative speakers. That wasn't a joke, but thank you. Um, uh, 
it's one of the ways that they sort of, in, it's a slippery new way they have of trying to get rid of the speakers they don't like. You will never find uh, a progressive, a liberal, a feminist, a Black Lives Matter, any of these speakers victim to last minute thousands of dollars in security fees. It just doesn't happen. But when conservatives decide, or libertarians even, or gays with the wrong opinions even, anybody who doesn't like the crazy batshit feminist left is invited onto campus. The students who do it will find themselves victim of these last minute security fees. Five days before the event, they'll say, hmm, yes, good, good luck with your event. By the way, three and a half thousand dollars by Wednesday or you can't graduate and the event won't happen. <laughs> anyway, this university very wisely, I think your acting president, your acting chancellor, very wisely rescinded that um, pending review of the entire policy. So, it's a, you know, it's worth... I spend a lot of time um, being mean about professors, throwing their picture up with, you know, with captions like fat faggot. Um, <laughs> he was. Um, but credit where it's due. You must always applaud people when they, do, when they do things that are right. Now, many universities have blocked my shows from speaking, uh, blocked me from speaking, but the $3,500, we're very happy, has been removed. Now, UNM knew the college Republicans had a slim chance of paying that fee since the college has already taken all their money through tuition fees. Um, but something amazing happened. It was the acting president, um, and it was uh, Chowki T. Abdullah, who, um, what he... <laughs> what he lacks in looks, he makes up for in his attitude to free speech and to security fees, so we should be grateful for that. And he said, the University of New Mexico is committed to the principles of free speech and values our role as a marketplace of ideas in the community, which is splendid. And it was followed up by a little bit of extra salt in the wound for social justice warriors. Just a little bit of extra pain for the feminist and Black Lives Matter campaigners. Marsha Baum, the chair of the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee, sent around her own communication to your professors. And it said, although we may disagree with the speaker's position or words, the university faculty should support each student's freedom of in inquiry and expression, both inside and outside of the classroom. Now, it might just be me, but I think that's the sound of social justice hegemony, of the iron grip of the worst, most bigoted, most um, fact-free, shrieking harpies on campus, determined to punish anybody who doesn't conform to their own bizarre, fact-free, conspiratorial view of the universe. That sounds to me like their iron fist falling away. So congratulations, you're welcome. We are making progress. <coughs> We're making progress. 2017, as I predicted it at the beginning of 2016, 2017 is the year social justice fucking dies. And now that we've established I can say whatever the hell I want, let's talk about borders. All right. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about your borders, America's borders, and why America both deserves strong borders and why you are not evil, heartless, terrible people for wanting them. There's no better place on my tour to talk about borders because we're in a border state. The Southwest down here has essentially become trans-Mexican. Thanks to decades of bad policy on illegal immigration, we can only pray that Daddy will reverse some of the damage. But before we talk about some of the policies that may... Well, I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to do it. I mean, have we, has there ever been a president who has enacted as much of what he promised to do in his first week in office? This has never happened before. I mean, the guy's just been on this incredible, like, executive order spree. They're just sort of like vomit. It just sort of keeps tumbling out of him. One day it's security. One day it's, it's wonderful. It's a politician who actually does what he says. It's incredible. But before we talk about some of those policies, uh, we have to knock down a few cherished liberal canals. The progressive left, and sadly establishment Republicans too, the mantra of globalism, globalization, has dictated unlimited immigration of everybody across completely open borders. You'll remember that Hillary Clinton was caught saying that she believed in completely open borders. And this is utterly retarded. Completely stupid, not least because, just because you share a border with a country geographically, you happen to be near them or next to them. Why does it follow that the citizens of one country must be compelled to pay for the citizens of another? To pay for their health care, to pay for schooling, to mop up the 
consequences of their crime. It's completely ludicrous. But it is a sort of, it's become a sort of maxim in polite society, even with, for those with conservative politics, that if you don't agree that you should simply take care of anyone who happens to find themselves in your country, that you must somehow be racist. But this isn't an... Are you right up there? But this isn't an issue of skin colours. It's an issue of borders and of ideas and of what it means to be a country and of how... Are you all right, sweetheart? Do you need some Xanax? <laughs> you seem to be very overexcited. There's a Q&A at the end. If you could save your boneheaded, obnoxious remarks for that, I'd be grateful. Thank you, darling. I'm perfectly happy for you to make an idiot of yourself later, but don't interrupt me or you'll, or you'll be asked to leave. All right, the first thing liberals say when you talk about controlling immigration is that you're racist. I mean, let's be honest, it's the first thing they say about anything. Any <laughs> liberals, are, liberals are freaking out about Donald Trump. They are freaking out about... <laughs> yes, there we go. Daddy. They can't handle it. They don't like it. He's president, and what can they do about it? Nothing! For the first time in recent memory, perhaps, an elected official is doing exactly what he said he was going to do. I mean, we, they probably thought that it was going to be all right, because we would vote for somebody and we'd get what they got with Obama, which is somebody who Trump promised to close Gitmo and didn't do it. Um, or maybe they thought we'd get a male Hillary who'd spend the first hundred days simply stealing whatever wasn't nailed down in the Oval Office. <laughs> But instead, but instead, they got a determined and crafty businessman who went to business doing exactly what he promised to do in the first place. It is their worst nightmare. A Republican who actually means what he says. You don't get it very often in politics in this country, but you do have one now, and he's in the White House. Now, you can't blame them for the mistake. The mainstream media called him a charlatan. Establishment Republican Cucks promised he was a leftist Democrat in disguise, but instead, he's daddy, and he's making America great again. Like any good businessman, the Donald knows that a one-size-fits-all solution fixes nothing. So he's addressing immigration problems in a number of different ways. Trump is about to put into place the temporary ban uh, he promised on immigration of any sort from selected Middle Eastern and African natures, uh, uh, nations like Syria and Somalia. And I can tell you, I'm not a citizen here, but I'm a visitor here, long-term visitor. Go home, good heavens. That's the, that's the sort of ugly attitudes you expect from Republicans. <laughs> Some people find things like that quite offensive. I'm, a I'm, I'm merely a visitor here, but I can tell you that I'm deeply comfortable with Trump's proposed ban, and you should be too. Because when you set aside the things that you must say to feel good about yourself and look instead at the facts, at the data, at the numbers, look. I mean, many of you don't have families yet, but you will do one day. And you imagine to yourselves what happens. And by the way, you know, some, you'll be insulated from some of this because you're college students. You'll be insulated from a lot of this because you, you will end up in socioeconomic brackets that protect you from the worst crimes. But the... That's all right, let them wear themselves out. They're like little energizer bunnies, you know. They hop up and down, not doing very much, and then eventually fall over, you know. <laughs> Nothing coherent to say. Okay. Um, the only sensible move before you know who is... I mean, you know, this country has been the victim of the worst terrorist atrocities anywhere in the world. And before you know who is who, it is sensible to draw a line under immigration from some places. Now, by this point, you'll, you'll wonder why I've been focusing so much on Islam, and it isn't just because it offends left-wingers. Um, it isn't just for the, these sorts of reactions, as much as I do enjoy them. Please keep them going. You're making me very, very wealthy. Um, I don't think they realize that this heats my pool. My God, what is that hat? Darling, we need a fashion check over there. What is... Oh, good heavens. What is that? Pink and yellow? Good Lord. I know that the first time you got a TV, it was in black and white, but the rest of life is in living color, and this is not okay. Now, only... 
Oh, she... oh, you're leaving because you've been asked to. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it sad what happens to women who don't have sex? It's awful. It's awful. No, I feel for her because I'm a compassionate person. You know, I'm a Christian, or at least I try. I try. I feel for her. You know, it can only be five, six, seven years before she's found dead, stinking of cat piss. I feel for her. <laughs> Poor little lamb. Now, I don't just dwell on the subject of Islam because it offends liberals, although that is a wonderful side effect. Um, however, um, you know, I do enjoy that, and we will just carry on, but I, I think we should look at some data. So it turns out, on, on extensive number crunching, that yes, Muslims do blow things up more than other people. Um, and so, in light of this and Trump's election, we looked into some more data. Um, here's another chart. Um, percentage of illegals are going home. All of them, um, hopefully. I mean, on the face of it, this shouldn't be difficult. You find out who wants to come to America. You ask them if they're dedicated to the destruction of capitalism and the Western way of life. More often than not, they'll tell you. <laughs> and you work out if they actually have anything to offer this country. It's so mystifying to me. I find this incredible. You know, this is, and I know I always say this, and I don't just say it to, for the nice reactions, but I really do mean it. Coming from Europe, you know, I'm so overawed by this country. It is the greatest nation in the history of human civilization. It's wonderful. But... But I sometimes wonder whether you know that. I sometimes wonder whether you know that. Particularly when, I, and it makes me very sad, you know, you hear some people outside my talk sometimes, you know, America was never great. Where the fuck would you rather be? Where would you rather be? Good Lord. Sometimes they'll try and be clever and they'll say Sweden. Oh, really? The rape capital of Europe. Would you like to, uh, would you like to take a wild guess why Malmo in Sweden is now the rape capital of Europe? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, Islamic immigration. Um, you know, anyway, I'm shocked by how few Americans realize what a great country this is and how few of them are dedicated to keeping it that way. Because you could choose anybody to come in. Just the fact that you share a border with somebody doesn't mean that you're automatically obligated to take food out of your own children's mouths and give it to someone else. Fucking mental. Well, maybe on special occasions. <laughs> That's Christian charity in action, rather than a Christian charity, of course, enabled by the Protestant work ethic in action, as opposed to taxation and redistribution by the state, which is what I'm talking about. But nice try. Till you're minding your own business in a gay club in Florida, and one of them opens fire. I'm sure. Now, you're made to feel bad about a lot of this stuff by a spate of hate crime hoaxes. And there are dozens of examples of this. In fact, I, I did an article that, sh that um, a little while ago on Breitbart. We found a hundred in the last uh, ten years of the, the, the hate crimes the media had really played up, you know, in an attempt to make you feel bad, you know, sort of. The, and the implication is that, you know, somebody like you did this, you know, and that's why we call you the names we do. And that's why you have to let us do all of the stuff that we want, because otherwise you're racist and you're saying that this is good. So whether it's, you know, the lesbians who painted queers on their own garage, or the lesbians who carve things into their own arms and claim they were raped at music festivals who weren't, or the lesbians, who, it is always lesbians, by the way, um, very often, very often lesbians, or whether it is some of the Islamic hate crime hoaxes we've been seeing more recently. And these happen with alarming frequency. In fact, I, I've struggled to find, my research team has struggled to find a supposed hate crime against Muslims on an American college campus that did not turn out to be fake. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about some of them. One student at the University of Louisiana admitted her attack was completely fabricated. She made the whole thing up because Trump supporters attacking a Muslim woman is simply believable to liberals fed a steady diet of hate by fake news. This is a rare instance of the lying media actually admitting that one of its cherished hate crimes was a hoax. Normally they just move on quickly and never mention it again. Yasmin Sawi, just 18 years, ago, 18 years old in New York City, made up a similar story. She said three men called her a terrorist and attacked her, telling her to get out of the country. Again, it was fake. 
but you won't read the corrections, you only read the outrage. Um, and here's a, a brand new one that can't be blamed on Trump supporters because it took place in Austria. A 14-year-old girl claimed she would, was attacked and the evil white men tried to rip off her hijab on a train. The police revealed it to be a complete fabrication as well. And a little closer to home. Oh, we're still having trouble at the back. Three down. <laughs> Three down. I think, if you, I think if you take the second left, the airport is just... Um... Actually, no, we don't want them there, do we? <laughs> it's a bit of a problem, actually. I, I hadn't really thought this through. <laughs> Cross the Atlantic. <laughs> a little closer to home at the University of New Mexico, a female Muslim student, freshman Lena Agard, told a similar story of suffering an attack at the hands of what she called a buff Trump supporter. This is what we know, uh, what we know in journalism as a tautology, because of course all Trump supporters are by definition stronger, hotter, funnier, smarter, and more popular than everyone around them. Now, the interesting thing about this case is that the story was dropped by the media almost immediately as soon as it was reported. Now, normally they try and follow up, they try to find out the perpetrator, they do these sort of color pieces, she might have got a segment on CNN, but something happened, they just sort of dropped it. And we got in touch with a few of these journalists and we couldn't work out why they dropped it and they wouldn't tell us. I mean, it must have been a real incident, she said so. I'm not accusing you of lying exactly, Lena, but how, why is it that you found time to report this to the, the press, this harrowing crime you, you supposedly endured? You found time to report it to the press but not to the police. Because when we checked, and when other, well, other journalists checked, it turned out that the only people who knew about this crime were left-wing journalists. The police had never heard of it, and they still haven't investigated it because she still hasn't reported it. Why would all these fake attacks be devised in such a way as to illustrate our differences? Well, I'll tell you the answer. These social activists, with the horribly regressive attitudes that they stick up for about women and gays and intolerance for non-Muslims, have no interest in assimilation. Let's talk about another group. Latinos face uh, a challenge in assimilation. For one thing, isn't he lovely? I love him. Um, for one thing, their identity is confused. Now, I've, my Hispanic friends are, you know, are very frustrated with me on this subject because they insist you know, they've got this proud Latino identity. And the problem is that nobody can really tell me what this means. And I've tried to ask, well, what does it mean? And ultimately, it just boils down to where they think their parents came from. And I've worked out that it's because the left has told them, you're, you're not white, you're a special group, so you get stuff. And if anyone's ever mean to you, it's because they're hateful, straight, white, male, misogynist, bigot, transphobe, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Zena, what, I mean, call them out, sure. Um, you know, tr Trump supporter, and it's more of a crime when people do bad things to you than it is when you do it to a white person because, well, we don't know really, but it's quite a good idea to just sort of divide people up like this because then they will end up voting for us. And the way that you know this is a sort of inve invention of the left, and I, feel, I sort of feel sorry for my Hispanic friends um, in this. The way you know it's an invention of the left is you ask people more probing questions about their identity, and you discover that this sort of Latino identity in the United States is almost entirely a sort of fabrication invented by the left, by academics and by journalists. This doesn't really mean anything. A 2011 Pew Research Center survey of Latinos in America showed that just 20% of them thought, thought of themselves as American. Only 24% of them, though, thought of themselves as Latino. So immediately you've got fewer than half of these, but they're really confused. And the remainder thought of themselves either a mixture or whatever they thought they might have come from if, uh, ultimately, and they didn't all know whether that was. It was Mexico or Brazil. According to this survey, saying Latino is a bit like saying LGBT or whatever letters they've added this week. <laughs> Gays and lesbians don't like being lumped together because we don't think alike at all, but people still do it, to say nothing of the offensive association with mentally ill cross-dressers. But Latinos, Latinos, according to that survey, seven out of ten Latinos don't believe there is a, a common Latino culture, because the whole thing is a liberal confection. And the other challenge we have with Latinos is language. Um, the book We Wanted Workers by George Borjas makes the, makes the argument that recent immigrants are learning English more slowly than previous immigrants, thanks to the rise of ethnic enclaves, sort of ethnic ghettos. This is, this is the Islam problem again. The multiculturalism project, the idea that we should divide everybody up, split them all up, let them just do their own thing in their own areas. Well, it's leading people to forget why they, they live in this country in the first place, and many of them to why they came here. It's not breeding good Americans, it's not breeding good citizens. 
before you start thinking this is from a right-wing think tank or an evil right-wing blog, Warhouse is a professor at Harvard, which is not exactly a hotbed of conservatism. And he is, of course, a Cuban immigrant as well. Immigrant Latinos are assimilating more slowly than they used to, thanks to progressive political policies. And part of the reason for that is, what are you doing back there? There's a very strange set of noises. You seem to, are you, are you trans hyena? 